Whether you're sending logs, metrics, traces, or events, you can do so much more than just putting it on the dashboard. We can use different baselining algorithms to figure out whether we have any type of seasonal or a floating anomaly. For instance, whether we have a spike or a drop in traffic. We can also forecast based on the data to figure out whether we are going to reach a certain limit in the near future. So for instance, whether you are about to consume all of the air budget and then act before it's too late. Now, if we can act on data that we predict, we talk about predictive automation. And this is exactly what I want to show you today. So what I have here is, let me just put this on the big screen. I have created a notebook that I've put on the playground so you can get the link to that notebook so you can see everything that I've done. Uh, just create a copy, download it, and uh, basically use it yourself. This was all inspired by a blog post from one of my colleagues, Wolfgang Beer, who talked about predictive capacity management. So really what this is all about is bringing this to life. It's two parts, and today, right now, you're watching part number one. Uh, I want to explain different types of baselining and forecasting with Dynatrace. Uh, what I have here, I have a couple of examples, and I want to start here with a very simple baselining and alerting example. This is based on the CPU usage per host. This is a very standard query, as you can see, a time series. You can either use uh, Davis Copilot or some of the pre-configured um, uh, time series uh, snippets. Now, basically, what I have here, as you can see, if I run this query for the last 24 hours, I have a nice spike of two or three data points. So this is just putting it on a chart. If I click on options, and actually let me just zoom out here a little bit to get a little bit more real estate on my screen. If I click on options, in Dynatrace, you could, I could switch to different visualizations, of course, obviously, like line error and so on. But really what I want to point your attention to is if you scroll down, you have the option here to select Davis AI. Davis AI means if you turn on the Davis AI, you can select between different anomaly detection mechanisms or different types of baselining. So really what this is, is you could, for instance, say, uh, I want to apply the auto adaptive threshold anomaly detection. And if I now run the query, I basically get the result on what the Davis AI would do if you would set up an alert or if you configure the anomaly detection exactly for this metric. In this case, nothing happens. Well, you want to ask, why is that? We have a clear spike. Well, the thing is, it's in the advanced properties, right? By default, uh, we are alerting on three violating samples. That means, in this case, we only have two data points that actually go up, uh, across the calculated threshold, which means this is just a little blip. It might just be a false positive alert. Now, you can configure if you really want to get alerted on it, and if you want to see the baseline uh, react to it, I could obviously be a little bit more stringent. I could even go down to one violating example. So the cool thing with this is I can run the query again, and now I get to see, hey, if I would have set this up, this baseline, on this particular query, I would have received an alert. So this is a really great way to play around with the baselining, also with the different baselining options we have in Davis whether it's the auto adaptive threshold. Let me just quickly pick the seasonal baseline. If I run this here, let's see what's happening. Ah, okay, <clears throat> it seems with the seasonal baselining, I immediately get uh, uh, an alert. Uh, and then what else do we have? Static threshold, right? This is kind of like our classic thing. With static thresholds, you can actually click on suggest values. What suggest values does, it actually looks at historical data that you have here and then it suggests a good baseline. Now, let me run this again, and let's see what will happen. In this case, it just it suggested 70% uh, of a threshold. Uh, this was just not enough, again, for the violating example. You can play around. What I really like about this, right, you can take the suggestion, you can play around, uh, you can uh, change the violating example, and I'm pretty sure now if I am with the 50% that I picked and the violating examples, I'm again I would, have, I would receive this uh, as an alert. Now, this is just visual now. I have it on a notebook. I can put this on a dashboard to see how the baseline work and how the normal detection work. If you want to take this really into action from here, you can say open with and then open up with the Davis anomaly detector. This now brings you in the anomaly detector app, which is the app that we've covered in a different video where you can now really set up the alert. And guess what? The query and all the settings are already taken over from a previous screen. 
I'm discarding this now and I want to just quickly switch back to my notebook because I want to finish this episode um, with, first of all, a couple of more examples. Right? If you scroll down, here's actually the CPU forecasting now. So let's look into forecasting. Same concept. Uh, I have the same metric. Now, in this case, you can see I'm not using uh, the DQL widget. I'm actually using the metric widget, which allows me to point and click and select which metric split by host in this case. But then, very similar, if you click on options, you can, instead of selecting one of the visualization options, I have already pre-selected this earlier, I've selected, I want to have the Davis analyzer, and I want to use the forecasting model. So similar to the anomaly detection, if you click on forecast, you can now specify how many data points should be forecasted and also what the offset is. So what does this mean? Let me quickly run this query. I have the last 24 hours here, so I have a certain number of data points, which means the forecasting will look at all of these data points, and then it will take this data and forecast in the same data granularity. You can see here, because I'm on 24 hours, uh, it defaults to 10-minute data points, 10-minute intervals. So that means I get 100 data points forecasted into the future, 100 times 10 minutes, 1,000 minutes into the future. And I get the band here. I get the forecasting and also the band. Now, if you have, in my, like in my case, multiple hosts, by default, that visualization will pick one metric. But right, if you have multiple dimensions, you can obviously select both or all of them, however you like. Obviously, you need to choose what's best, how much you really want to see, and what is the thing you're really interested in. I think for my case, I had, yeah, I think they all actually look pretty nice. So let's select this again. Um, so this is kind of the, the forecasting, what you can do. Now, I gave you a couple of additional examples because this is not bound and limited to metrics. Here, what I have is fetching logs make time series. Now, let me actually first go back and turn off Davis forecast. Let me just click run here. And if I click on run, it basically fetches all the logs from the last 24 hours and gives me a time series count. Now, I can now, with the options, I can go back to my visualization. And as I said, normally, you might want to do a line chart, right? This is, I think, a classical thing. Now, very simple. If you want to forecast or if you want to do the uh, baselining, what we had earlier, click on Davis AI, enable the analyzer, select your model, your analyzer model. Again, data points, how many in the future? Now, the offset, I didn't explain the offset earlier. The offset means, do you want to take all the data points into consideration until the very end, or do you want to skip the last one to 10 data points? Now, why would that be? I, I'll select 10 now and click Run, and while it runs, I explain. Um, the forecasting offset means sometimes when the last data that comes in still needs to be processed, still needs to be aggregated. Think about an average of a 10-second interval you may not really have all the data points yet, so you can use the forecasting capability, the offset capability, to now say, you know, ignore the last couple of data points, like this one here that would go, you know, kind of fall down because not all of the data is yet here for that aggregation point. Um, this is really what this is all about, so predicting this into the future. Now, I'll show you this on logs. What else do we have? I have another example on business events. Again, any data point, that you can convert, any query that you can convert into a time series. Like in this case, I'm extracting the total amount of revenue generated that was sent in to Dynatrace as a business event. I'll chart it and I'll forecast it. It's as simple as this. And last but not least, uh, another example on forecasting disk space. So, right, uh, very common use case. What's my disk space? Uh, what's my free disk space? Forecast it when I'm about to run out of disk. These are some of the use cases, which concludes part number one. In part number two, we take exactly that predicting the disk utilization, putting it into a workflow so that we can then act and execute actions when we are predicting that we're running low on disk. And this is exactly what this blog post also was all about. Now with this, um, I hope this was uh, insightful. Uh, let me move up here again. Uh, check out the, uh, oops, scroll up again. Check out the notebook. The link is in the description. And uh, play around with the different baselining and with the forecasting. You can do it on really any type of query. See you next time.
拜。